Hi, I'm Aaron Kionez. And I'm Jane Nivey. Welcome to SRTV. If you missed the eclipse, you won't be able to see one for the next 20 years. Many traveled all over the country just to get a glimpse of the eclipse. Airbnb reported that 90% of Airbnbs in the path of the totality in the U.S. were booked. Now to Lucy Burns with the weather. Hi, I'm Lucy Burns with the weather for the coming week. We will see a change from the sunny skies earlier this week to showers on Thursday. The temp could get up to 66 degrees, but expect it to feel warmer due to high levels of humidity. Expect more rain Friday with the same range of temperatures, starting in the mid-40s and reaching the mid-60s. It cools down a bit on Saturday with cloudy skies, but the rain and higher temperatures return on Sunday. The sun partly comes back out Monday through Wednesday, with temps ranging from the mid-40s and even getting up to 68 degrees on Tuesday. Showers return early in the day next Thursday with a low of 48 and a high of 63. Back to you, Jaden. Thanks, Lucy. Professor Jamie Eigelhart showcased her planned documentary called Goodbye, Dear Neighbor at the Albany Film Festival this past weekend. Eigelhart and her film crew discussed the goals and production process of the documentary to a full room at their panel discussion. The film tentatively titled Goodbye, Dear Neighbor chronicles life at the school during its final semester. Here's a brief clip from the preview. St. Rose announced officially on December 1st that uh, it's going to close. The closure is heartbreaking. I get an email from this um, journalist with the headline, St. Rose Closure. If I weren't so mad about the way you've heard this information, rather than hearing it today from us, I'd be in tears. Um, it looks like we're going to have a new front page story, guys. <laughs> I, definitely, I definitely do feel a lot of admiration towards the faculty here, and that does keep me going. Um, I have felt that we have found this uh, very important a significant niche for our work. So I've always been a writer and this is like my, my niche, like this is what I feel the best doing. The main inspiration for this piece was to focus on mental health. I know this topic and I think now is an even better time to talk about it when we're going through such a challenging period. People need to know that you know you're not the only one going through what you're going through. You know you got people who've been here for so long, family invested so much money into it, you know, there's a financial part of it. You know, somebody can become, go from financially stable to four years of giving money to something, if it even amounts to something, to financially instable. Just like that, you know? People need to feel what they're feeling. Some people I talk to are very, very angry. Some people are feeling disenfranchised. Some are sad. Some are trying to spend as much time with friends and, you know, campus friends as they can. Spent the last 14 years here. If I had a wand, I would probably wish for the school not to close. I love it here. So if there was just that interval of it possibly staying open, I'd be so down to stay. I'm going to miss this place a lot. sorry that it has to go. This is the best journalistic experience that I could have ever had because I'm getting real world, like real time, serious events happening that are like severely impacting my direct community and I'm right at the heart of it. So being able to just pounce on that and really like milk the experience for all you can get out of it in these last few months that we're still here, that's the best thing that you can do. This semester has really helped open my eyes for what I wanted to do. Learning about the school closing was like, all right, I, mean, I just got here. I don't feel too bad about it. And then I learned I could graduate from here. I was like, oh, that's actually super exciting. Because I've got to know people, other professors here, and other students. And I think, honestly, the school closing made me reflect more on the time that I've had here. Because I was kind of just going through the motions, just getting my degree. But uh, it's... It's been a really good experience and I've enjoyed it a lot. really appreciate the school that you have and the people you're with because mm -hmm. yeah. it could be gone in like mm -hmm. a moment. You never know. Yeah. So we like have 
um, a good memory of what happened here, like especially in the last semester. I feel like it's important to have something together in a form that you can look at it to remember that something was real. I try to be grateful for having had time just dealing with grief and loss, that idea of helping my students to be able to predict what's going to happen and then prepare is just huge. It feels really good when it's over and then you have something cool to look back at and be like, wow, I did this. And uh, it gets you to meet some really cool people. Some of the music that I've made and I've been part of that is released, it's out and or will be out and will be forever, everywhere. It's it's a little legacy that yeah. I will not forget. A school shutting down can't change what you've done. Mm -hmm. These kids are great. I shouldn't call them kids, you know? Why do I say that? They're great. They're just great. They, um... I'll be sorry when it's over. Eigel Hart says she wants to have the film finished soon and hopes that the film can be part of a discussion among higher education and the communities affected by the growing number of schools closing. She said it's important to rewrite the narrative on this important topic. For updates on Teach Out Schools, St. Rose has just added another school to their Teach Out list. Adelphi University has been added this week. The college is still actively discussing agreements with four more schools, including Nazareth University, St. Thomas Aquinas, SUNY Cortland, and Su SUNY Fredonia. Last week, St. Rose faculty had officially infor informed by administration that the college cannot provide severance pay or extended health benefits to faculty or staff due to budgetary constraints. Several faculty members have been outwardly upset by the news and are in search of more answers from administration. The New York State Museum hosted Celebrate St. Rose Day on Friday, March 22nd to celebrate the legacy of the college along with its history of New York. Both Savannah Tarepka and Amir Galban were on the scene for the event. We're here at the New York State Museum celebrating St. Rose Day where students get to attend and learn about New York State's history through exhibits and displays. The museum trip was planned by Professor Jessica Otatigbe of the Comm Department with her 430 class. Otatigbe and her students spent months preparing for this event. We started this project last semester and the whole idea was to connect students with a community client uh, that's in the area and have them work with them on some kind of strategic advertising proposal. I had my students visit the museum and when we visited the museum the conversation led into how can community organizations find a way to engage college students and so that's how the, um, that's how the event was created. The New York State Museum created a host of different activities and exhibits for our students and others that were going to join. Due to the news of St. Rose's closure, the trip had to be postponed from its original date last semester. Otatigbe and her students took this extra time to plan. This trip was all done with the goal in mind of bringing students and faculty together for a final celebration before the end of the semester and St. Rose as a whole. I think that it's a wonderful opportunity for these types of organizations to find a way to engage with college students. And so to be able to create a special day for college students to come to the museum and hang out and check out what it has to offer, I'm really happy. Professor Otatigbe Bay acknowledges how difficult it can be for everyone at St. Rose to maintain high spirits during this time, emphasizing the importance of community. At the end of the day, there's nothing that we can do about the campus closing. I have other thoughts about that. But for what remains of the semester, I think that being able to create an opportunity for our students and members of the campus community and also supporters of St. Rose to just gather and hang out is wonderful. Now at the end of the academic semester, this is the countdown for summer. This is the last outing where St. Rose students can gather together and connect. Back to you guys at the studio. Professor Jessica Otatigbe organized the event hoping to bring students together before the end of the final semester here at St. Rose. And now, with the latest on Golden Knights teams is Louis Daou. The men's baseball team was away Tuesday against Mercy, losing to the Mavericks 11-6. 
Chase Carroll and Nathan Toms both reached base in all five plate appearances for St. Rose. Carroll finishes three for three with two walks, while Toms nailed two hits and three walks, also having an RBI. The women's softball team took on American International in a doubleheader Tuesday, winning both games. The first was 6-2 to two and the second was 6-5. to five. Madison Chandler went 2-2 two for two with two doubles and a sacrifice fly to total four RBIs for the Golden Knights in Game 1. Adian Shearer struck out five in a complete game win for the opener. Game 2 between the two squads stayed tight until a game-winning walk-off two-run double by Kelsey Higgins in the bottom of the seventh allowed the Golden Knights to win 6-5. to five. The men's lacrosse team beat Franklin Pierce on Tuesday. The final score was 15-9 with notable efforts from Cam Smith scoring four goals. Jack Rice, Nate Ham, and Elijah Martin also contributed two goals in the effort. Eight different Golden Knights registered two or more points on the night to secure the team's first NE10 league win of the spring season. Their next game will be away against American International on Saturday. The women's lacrosse team takes on Franklin Pierce away Saturday at 4. That will be it for this edition of St. Rose Sports. I'm Louie, back to the studio. J. Cole has dropped a 12-track album titled Might Delete Later after being dissed by rapper Kendrick Lamar. Cole throws multiple shots at Lamar throughout the album, especially in his song Seven Minute Drill. After the success of her album, Scarlet, Doja Cat has dropped Scarlet 2, Claude, the, de the, the deluxe version featuring ASAP Rocky and Tizo Touchdown, and includes seven new tracks. This past weekend, WWE hosted their yearly event, WrestleMania, which featured many WWE legends such as John Cena, The Rock, and Undertaker. The event happened on both Saturday and Sunday with many amazing matches featuring Roman Reigns, Cody Rhodes, and Bianca Belair. If you miss WrestleMania, it is available to stream on Peacock. In the National Lacrosse League, Albany's own Albany Firewolves ranked third in the league and clinched a playoff spot on March 30th. After the Halifax Thunderbirds beat the Rochester Nighthawks in their last outing against the Toronto Rock, they lost 10-7. The Firewolves play again next Sunday the 14th against Panther City. We now go to Real Reviews where Amir Galban discusses the popular new Netflix series, Three Body Problem. Three Body Problem embarks on an enthralling narrative journey based on the award-winning novel Internationally Celebrated Trilogy by Chinese author Xi Jin Liu with a novel of the same name. The three creators, David Benioff, D.B. Weiss, Alexander Wu, use specific stylistic elements such as chronological shifts, character tweaks, expansions, and setting the present-day story primarily in the UK. They blend elements of science fiction, mystery, and human drama. For example, in the series, viewers will see a writing on the wall with a countdown displaying a time in the sky, even with flashbacks to 1960s China when we learn surprising revelations such as China building a radio transmitter to listen and talk to extraterrestrials. Beginning in 1960s China, a young woman's consequential decisions sets off a cascade of events that challenge the very laws of nature. In the present day, a diverse ensemble of brilliant scientists and a resolute detective must unite to confront an unprecedented threat to humanity. Suddenly, scientists around the world start to discover that their scientific equipment started showing different results than their theories predicted. In layman's terms, the laws of physics began to work differently. The best scientists shut down their projects and even took their own lives. Most of the people who died were going insane. The Oxford Five are the series protagonists that all attended Oxford University. A mentor's suicide brings them closer, triggering the events leading to a huge mystery. The Oxford Five consists of Jin Cheng, played by Jess Hing, Augie Salazar, played by Isa Gonzalez, Jack Rooney, played by John Bradley, Saul Duran, played by Jovan Adipo, and Will Drowning, played by Alex Sharp. The detective known as Da Shi plays an intricate part in helping the Oxford Five. All of the characters discover unique objects and visuals. Jin, for example, finds a virtual reality set. She is put in an elaborate virtual reality where she can feel and smell. Jack also gets a helmet in the VR. There are 
cataclysms from the weather, and more. In desperate circumstances, people learn how to dehydrate themselves and rehydrate again. We learn that disasters are unpredictable and the goal of the game is to find the cause to the tragedies. When going through a series of levels, they learn their planet is revolving around three suns because of the chaotic movement. This is known as the three-body problem. It turns out that in four light years from the Earth, there are three stars orbiting that consist of aliens that survive by traveling to Earth. Through communications with an organization that recruits, associates, and destroys science so humans can't stand up to the aliens when they come. One dead scientist, found by investigator Da Shi, had a VR helmet that is years ahead technologically, giving a digital imprint on the person wearing it. It is believed to be a conspiracy, including the crea creators of the VR, that can project people and numbers onto the retina without them actually being there, tricking the entire universe. Antagonists such as you, Wenji, and Mike have been treated like dirt by humans. We learn you is the one communicating with the aliens with a sun amplifier. Yu Wenji sent the message to them to invade. When Yu leaves China, Mike meets her and funds her project to help the aliens by buying a huge ship with an antenna filled with cult followers. The plan by Da Shi and Jin is to stretch a special string created by Augie out of a strong material between the two banks of the canal. The ship and its inhabitants are shred into the strips a hard drive with alien data and a special message for the VR players was received when Jim puts the VR on. We hear the story of the alien race known as the Santee. They are afraid of humans, especially from our quick developments with technology and ability to lie so easily. The plan to prevent a war from happening in 400 years is to send someone to the alien civilization so they can study us. They learn you can't send the whole body in space and decide to send only the brain. Throughout the season, we see the story of Will, a member of the Oxford Five who was diagnosed with cancer. With only a couple months to live, Will agrees for his brain to be used. Saul, a part of the Oxford Five, started receiving assassination attempts by aliens. After the first one, Saul is loaded onto an airplane for a United Nations meeting. Project Wallfacer, who was created by Saul, is announced to be used to give three humans extreme capabilities to outsmart the aliens. As Saul leaves the meeting, he is abruptly shot, but survives. With its intricate storyline and exploration of human connection, Three Body Problem promises to redefine the sci-fi genre, offering readers a captivating and thought-provoking experience. From the events of season one, it is developing into a long journey that can lead to there being a second season. Thanks, Amir. In last week's issue of The Chronicle, a front page story covered how political science student Mariah Elmquist started an online petition to ban President Marsha White and the Board of Trustees from commencement. As of today, the petition has 217 signatures. Other articles in last week's Chronicle include updates on faculty concerns about a lack of severance pay and health care after the semester ends, and also a feature on the store downtown nutrition on North Pearl Street. Copies are available in racks around campus. That's all we have this week for St. Rose Television. I'm Aaron Quiones. And I'm Jane Nivey. Thanks for watching SRTV.